You're traveling into another dimension. A wondrous journey deep into a pop culture realm that has influenced generations of fans and filmmakers. An examination of the work and influence of a man named Rod Serling. An exploration we call Deep in the Zone. Hi, I'm David Levin and welcome to our deep dive into the Twilight Zone. And today we are talking about the season three opener which starred Elizabeth Montgomery and Charles Bronson in a little piece that they call two. That's two, T-W-O, not two or the other two, or the, you know, just two, uh, which is about two people and just the tiniest bit of dialogue. And to make sure that we don't miss a thing, I've invited my pal Herbie J. Pilato, host of Then and Again with Herbie J. Pilato, which... The toughest thing, like with the Dick Van Dyke show, is finding someone named Herbie J. Pilato to host a show called Then Again with Herbie J. Pilato. Um, that's always been the big issue. Uh, what, did, what did Rose Marie say when she first heard Dick Van Dyke's name? What's, a what's Dick that Van Dyke? Dick Van Dyke? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so here we are with the man himself, the expert on all things bewitched and many, 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 many other aspects of uh, classic pop culture. And so, and we, we, we get along like a house on fire. So today we're going to be doing um, two. And, uh, and uh, anything you want to say before we get started about two, Herbie? Okay. Well, just, just the similar, I mentioned it in, when we talked about um, Agnes Moorhead a couple of weeks ago, that the Agnes Moorhead episode and the, the major Dick York episode and the Elizabeth Montgomery episode of Twilight Zone all have to do with, in some form or another, silence, uh, which I think was very interesting how that worked out in the big scheme of things. Uh, you know, Agnes Moorhead doesn't have any dialogue in um, The Invaders, from uh, that episode of The Invaders, excuse me, that episode called The Invaders, not The Invaders TV show. Right. And Dick York, A Penny for Your Thoughts, he hears the thoughts of others and he really doesn't hear them speak. And Elizabeth, in this episode, she only has one line which we'll talk about so yeah i think that's interesting if you've never seen this episode spoilers are ahead you are warned go see it on netflix or amazon prime or wherever you got to see it uh we are going to go and i'm going to give this over to our buddy rod serling so rod take it away <laughs> You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Look at that font. Yeah. That yeah. very straightforward font. I like the other one better. Uh, me too. Well, that's this the one that's the classic one. This is a jungle, a monument built by nature honoring disuse, commemorating a few years of nature being left to its own devices. But it's another kind of jungle, the kind that comes in the aftermath of man's battles against himself. Hardly an important battle, not a Gettysburg, or a Marne, or an Iwo Jima, more like one insignificant corner patch in the crazy quilt of combat, but it was enough to end the existence of this little city. It's been five years since a human being walked these streets. This is the first day of the sixth year, as man used to measure time. Those legs. We had great legs. I'm glad that I'm glad that the soldiers' uniforms had had you know mini skirts. It was clearly very very like, far. Like on Star Trek. Like I on was, Star Trek. You're very. Well, the first thing that I I thought of when I saw this episode is, oh my God, it's Serena. Because <laughs> she got dark hair. <laughs> Black hair, so that was, that freaked me out. Oh, let's let Rod turn. The time, perhaps a hundred years from now, or sooner, or perhaps it's already happened two million years ago. The place, the signposts are in English so that we may read them more easily, but the place is the Twilight Zone. And actually, the place where they filmed this, it was like the old Max. Um, uh, Hal Roach, Hal Roach Hal Studios. Roach. The Hell Road Studios, where they did Laurel and Hardy and the Art Gang movies. And they did a lot of more current things. They were just about to tear it down, I understand. Um, 
And notice it was written in, and directed by Montgomery um, Pitt. Mon yeah, exactly, by M Montgomery Pittman. Uh, so do you, would you happen to know what else was shot at this particular studio? I know how Roach shot there with Laurel and Hardy. Anybody else that we're aware of? There were others. There were a lot. There were a lot others, but I don't recall any. Well, but we will. Uh, you see, the main a... ones were yeah. the the, the uh, Laurel and Hardy and the our gang, and the whole thing was that you know he went on to live forever, you know. Yeah. Um, he, 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 you know, the studios might have been polished, but he moved on. He wasn't attached to any of it, and uh, he went on to live to be a hundred himself. So. Yeah. In fact, I remember at the Academy Awards, he was honored by Billy Crystal and uh, Hal Roach, who worked in the silent films. And they couldn't get him. He, he, he stood up in the uh, audience and he started making a speech and they didn't have a microphone for him. And he talked and talked and the audience there heard him. But on TV, we heard nothing. And um, and Billy Crystal came on afterwards and said, well, that's that's very appropriate since he got his start in silent movies. So. Which, by the way, is appropriate that there's not a lot of dialogue in this? Yes. Uh, they probably couldn't afford the microphones. <laughs> uh, very interesting. You know, this is one of just a few episodes of The Twilight Zone where there's almost no dialogue. As you said, the other one was Agnes Moorhead, completely dependent on the actors and the director, uh, you know, finding the bits of business and, and giving them that place to do this. And the way to do this and all the acting had to be done with their eyes and their faces and their body language. And I want you to watch the body language as as Charles Bronson, who's appearing here, and Elizabeth Montgomery start to interact with each other. Did she really throw that knife at him? Was it a real knife? That was well, crazy. it may have been a real knife, but I don't think he was actually standing there when she threw it. <laughs> Oh, go back, go back and look at that. It yeah, but it was like... done in it was done in two cuts, Herbie. Take a oh, look. Two cuts. Right, she throws it. Throws the knife. Well, watch it, watch it. Yeah, but that that was somebody else threw it above his head from probably more closely. The magic of movie making. She's not actually throwing it at him. You would you would think you would have you wouldn't have to explain that to me, right? But well, I'm here for you, Herbie. I know you're just you. <laughs> You're just a neophyte. And by the way, she doesn't really only speak Russian. She's actually just playing a part. I'm just letting you know. Interestingly. And that's not her. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's, that's a her. stunt double. Right. It's fighting scene. It's a, yeah, stunt double. Um, interestingly, again, the black hair and the makeup. And she actually asked them. And she tried to get herself made up even worse to, to look yeah. worse and they had to encourage her, No, you still have to you still have to be good looking. Yeah. Yeah, she wanted to darken the eyes a a, a great deal more. This is interesting too, because this is before he became, you know, Charles Bronson, obviously. Yes. And I'm not sure if he was married to Jill Ireland at the time, but certainly his uh, his wife Jill, she did a wonderful episode. Uh, first season episode of Star Trek, mm -hmm. where he uh, she brought she fell in love with Mr. Spock. I remember and that episode. Yes, heartbreaking. heartbreaking. Look at him. Look at him and eat that chicken as if there's no concern over Salmonella. How long has that chick been? Nobody has. <laughs> nobody has been in this city for six years, and he just picks up a piece of chicken and starts eating. And granted, he's starving. No, but it, was, but... It, was it was in a can. So it was, it was, it was okay. chicken in a can. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Just munching down that chicken, boy. As if, you know, like, like, all right. I so, never asked Elizabeth about this episode. Really? You know? I'm surprised. Yeah. I was remiss about it because when I met her in 89, we, it was the focus was really on Bewitched. And, right. And, and a couple other uh, sessions after that first meeting, we talked about her movies, but there was no IMDb in those days. Yeah. So two was really the only episode that I really knew of that she did beyond Bewitched. But for some reason, I didn't even talk about it. But she was nominated for an Emmy for The Untouchables. Oh, wow. Which, where she played a prostitute. And in that episode, David White makes a guest appearance. And this is all before pre, Bewitched. Pre, pre Witched. Pre Witched. 
so but the, she loved she loved doing uh, these vi- I mean she was always challenging herself as an actress certainly uh before but which and definitely after the witch when she did on you know legend of lizzie borden and a case of rape and she wanted to show everybody that she just wasn't this this uh, comedian or this comedic actress but she made over 200 guest appearances in general beyond the witch so it was really kind of amazing and anything, her- certainly anything that was was on tv before the witch at the time she made a guest appearance on and her dad was was actor Robert Montgomery. She came from a showbiz family, so who did not want her to be an actress. Interesting. Which, he never even let her go to the movies. <laughs> he would say, "But I want to go to the movies." And well, uh, Clarice is going to. I don't care what Clarice is doing. You're not going to the movies. That's so funny. But when she finally convinced him that she was serious about acting, she made her TV debut on his show called Robert Montgomery Presents in an episode called Top Secret, where she played her, his daughter in that episode, which was interesting. Not Elizabeth Montgomery, but he, she was playing his character's daughter. Right. Uh, wow. Well, it's who you know. <laughs> Although in her case, she, she proved out the... Uh... Now, what's really interesting about her character here, and, and you don't see it here, but I want you to watch for it, in addition to the to the body language throughout, her character is almost childlike, and you'll see it in the way she behaves. Um, I was watching this earlier today, and the way she, she deals with him, she's almost like a child. And you'll see that you'll see that coming up. First, he's gonna uh, He's going to wake her up in not the nicest way. She's, you know, she ends up really being the, the meanie at the beginning. Yes. Well, she's, she's been trained, but look how she moves. She moves like a child. She's been trained as a, so this is how I look at it. And she uses this, she's been trained as a soldier, but she's, she's really a child who was drafted, I think. Because if they were having, you think about it, if they had women soldiers at this time, you know, which takes place in the future, but it means everybody was fighting and it means she was, you know, if you look at that character, she's very childlike in addition to being a well-trained soldier. Interesting. I suppose not. Interesting that they chose English and Russian for the two characters also. Yeah. Yeah. There's no longer yeah. any reason for us to fight. And that's the uh, underlying. There's it's no longer, no longer reason for us to fight, but she doesn't understand. Only so rags much. of various colors that were once uniforms. Like the two sets of rags we wear. And she doesn't have her um, her big eyelashes on, which is what she wore on Bewitched a lot. Right. And she didn't wear those eyelashes really that much in television. Um, but on Bewitched, it became a weekly thing, and she hated it. She hated wearing the, the, the eyelashes, and she hated doing the twitch later for people when, in real life whenever they asked her. Interesting. But she enjoyed doing this episode. That I know. Mm. Um, she, she enjoyed it very much. I, I love... You know, I, 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 you can't always see it on Bewitched, but except maybe in the early episodes, to pay the, depending on the way they, they lit it. But in this, you can really see that cleft in her chin. It's just so prominent in the way they lit this and in the way they do it. And her eyebrows, too. Her, she had the same eyebrows as her father. <laughs> no, arched in the middle. So little dialogue. And it's interesting, he's kind of got like a modern haircut here. Yeah. <laughs> the way it's spiked like that. Now watch what happens when she starts to follow him. What, first of all, she grabs her, she grabs a little bit of chicken. Because Salmon. hey, you know, because it's chicken. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> and she's gonna follow him at a little bit of a, of a remove. Almost like, there's almost little. like an animal, like a cat-like. Just- like a little pet, a little pet, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he doesn't go out yet. He, she doesn't go out yet. She doesn't follow him. But here, 
you'll see a couple of interactions here when he realizes that he can he can take a shave and she can wash up and, and she never you'll see she never takes her eyes off him when she when she enters the room i i they they are in love you know they don't really know it yet but they're they're in love and ultimately this episode is adam and eve the new world well, you know, I was going to say, I was going to say, I was going to say, and I, I was going to save it for later, but I was going to say, when I originally saw this episode, after having sort of gotten the, the twists of the Twilight Zone, I thought for sure he was going to say Adam, and she was going to say Eve. You know, yeah. I thought for sure that was going to happen, and I was, and watching it again for the first time in years, I was so relieved that they didn't do that, because that would have been just... That would have been too typical, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and yet, it probably would have been one of the first ones. I think they did do an episode like that. Um, I don't have to look around. I haven't watched all the episodes yet. They did do an episode where one of them was Adam and one of them was Eve. And years later, okay, here she comes into the into the room. Um, years later, there was a comic strip where you see these two people and they're meeting, and clearly they're you know they're from another planet and they've landed on this thing, and it's similar to this but not quite. And they finally sort of get to the point where they where they are willing to sort of make peace and and realize they have anyway. So this comic book um, happened, and these two people met, and they were going to do. Um... Watch her for a moment. She never takes her eyes off him, and I'm going to get back to my thing in a moment. Adorable. She catches it, and watch what she yeah. does. Watch what she does with the snow with the soap. Yeah, she smells it. You know, she's like, oh, I can wash up, but I'm not, I'm not trusting him. I'm keeping my knife close. I'm keeping so my knife close. So I guess they, they've been on this world, if it's Earth, I'm, yeah, it's Earth. Yeah. And for five years, they've been roaming. So they haven't showered in five years. There's not been a body of water anywhere? I imagine that they must have washed at some point. They found a body of water. It's not like, it's not like the Wicked Witch of the West who could never wash because she would melt. Um who must have smelled awful, and that's why her skin was green. No, I think in this particular situation, they have washed, but this is really nice, a nice chance to freshen up before their date. Uh, anyway, so in this comic strip, these two people meet, and they fall in love, and at the end of it, he goes, uh, by the way, my name's Adam, and she goes, really? Mine's Gertrude. So just a twist on the expectation of that, ooh, you know, it's a twist ending. Uh, well, it's always nice to have for it, for it not to be like it should have been. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's always nice to take it in a new direction or yeah. in a different direction. Well, you know, some of the star, some of the uh, episodes of Twilight Zone at the time were, you know, just such shocking twists. And now some of them have become cliches, like it's a cookbook or, you know, or yeah. uh, my wife. And, and, well, my, and again, the, the twists are nice. But yeah. to me, this is not, even though I love Elizabeth Montgomery, um, and I think Charles is great here, it's still not a, an ideal Twilight Zone episode. It's still too realistic. I don't like, I, I would rather that this world, they would have walked into one of these doors and gone into another dimension. That's what I wanted to see. That's what I want to see with every Twilight Zone, is that they, they go to this place that's not, realistic this is just this is just a horrific happenstance in in a real world but it's it's not supernatural in any way no it's just it, it's it's science fiction and at the time don't forget there was no science fiction on tv this was where you went to get your science fiction on television and this was what everything else was compared to for years yeah but is this episode really science fiction okay is it really? It's just about the 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 after the apocalypse or the or the third world war. That's not science fiction. Speculative future fiction. Then let's call it. Let's you know. There's it's it's it's. I I agree with you. It's not a typical Twilight Zone, but it does. I think it fits the genre. Although Twilight Zone just basically defined the genre. Now there was a moment there, by the way. Where they were, we were standing in front of a movie theater with a romantic movie playing, and it looked like they were going to get romantic, and then they both grabbed guns. So, yeah. uh, just really taking every opportunity to plant those seeds in the audience uh, that oh maybe they said now watch this this would never fly 
if they made this show, this episode today, watch this, watch what happens. They look at the, they look at the dress. She had looked at it before. Now she says the one word in the whole thing. Procrasny, which means pretty. It's the only Russian I know, except for Dalsvidanya. You know, and it's interesting too, um, when Re Rebecca Asher, who was Elizabeth's daughter, um, through William Asher, they had three other, two other children, Watch Billy this. and Robert Asher. One second. One Watch. of the things that Rebecca talked about in missing her mother was her mother's voice. That pain that her mother's voice had. So even here, just with one word, she makes an impact with, with her amazing voice. So he says to her, put it on. Okay? That's crazy. I like, <laughs> only in 1960, you know, or that in that period would he go, here, put this on. You know, it's like, it's like, it's just would never fly if this episode were made today. He's like, he's going to sit back and wait for her to put it on. And she's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go put it on. Sure. Why not? Maybe if she said to him, put it on. No, you put it on. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. <laughs> now, the other thing I want to point out here is when she goes inside, I want you to look at the posters that she's looking at, the posters that are going to convince her that she's got to go back out and, and shoot at him. Look at the design of these posters. Um they're clearly the pop propaganda posters that were put up during the course of the war and you can see one in the background right now you can't see it too too large but i'll blow this up when we when we show it um and she's like she's about to put the dress on she's like what am i doing and she looks at the posters and check this out look at the design of them there is a very classic yeah. almost like reminiscent of the of the posters that were made during the nazi era or during the the um early you know communist era there's there's a stylistic they don't copy what that was but there's a stylistic i don't know who did this i mean the art directors you know are credited at the end of the show but i don't know if that they were the actual ones who designed these posters but they're terrific And it's a changing point for her. Yeah. It puts her back in that place where, oh, yeah, this guy is my enemy. Yeah. They bring it in, and she's like, oh, yeah, right. That's what we're fighting. What are we fighting for, you know? And she's like, yeah, that guy, that guy, I got to go. I can't put on a dress. I got to kill him. And then watch. I was expecting gunfire, but watch. Yeah. It's and laser. now it becomes science fiction. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> a laser shot. Yes. Yes, this is not a regular war. This is not, you know, the 1961. This is sometime later. Or it's not on this planet. Well, and, and as, as, um, as, as Serling himself at the beginning said, this could be two million years ago or it could be tomorrow. We don't know. We're not telling you. The signs are in English for... Sorry, the signs are in English for our convenience, but they might not be in, with the implication being they might not be in English at all. And that's right. that's also interesting. And they're, you know, the fact that she's speaking Russian, she could have been speaking anything, but but right. but they they made a creative choice. Yeah. And it certainly ties into uh, the, the end of the episode. You know, one line that she says. Yeah, yes, yes. And now look at the way she's sitting, again, like a little girl. Okay, it really speaks volumes about her character. She is like a little girl. She's there's an innocence to her, despite the fact that she's a soldier and she's on guard every moment. She gives this character again a sweetness, a sweetness. As hard edged as she is, there's an underlying innocence. And, and she would have to be for her to be again liked by the audience. And here we're talking about, you know, we're talking about likability and, and charm. Well, nothing point. says that she had to be liked, but, but yes, th th there's but nothing, we, there was nothing written in stone that she had to be. But, she, know, but yeah. she has to be, she has to show some kind of heart for us to warm up to her so that what happens to them at the end makes it okay. Yes. Well, exactly. And she does that. The, it's just their faces, you know, the best acting really does that you know and charles bronson was an, an actor of limited talent but he brought what he needed to here um 
nothing against Charles Bronson. What he did, he did better than anybody. But he wasn't one of those people that you'd say, wow, this is, this is a guy who could play this most subtle drama. But here, it, it completely works. That, 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 that over-the-top and yet not toxic masculinity that he brings to the role. Exactly. And I love the music. It's just... Blow away. Blow away! No, she says. You go take your war to more suitable companions. That's a civilian territory. And now she makes the big reveal. Yep. Still with a gun. Yeah. Still with a gun. Yep. But oh boy. She fills out that well, dress you know, for any, any true love story, it starts out slow, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a meat cue. You, know, you don't want to have him kiss in the first five minutes. It always takes all the great love stories. They kiss in the end. No, they don't. I don't think they really kiss They don't kiss in this. But they do come very close to touching. Listen to him. Procrastinate. There you go. Pretty. Ooh, he threw something to eat. That's an act of true love. Now watch, your mother wears combat boots. Okay, procrastinator means, of course, pretty, yep. which is she thought the dress was, and now he sees her in the dress, says pretty, yes. they bond, fall in love. You almost want him to shake or to, to start holding hands here, but they don't, and but they you don't. know they will. Later. Eventually, when they, when they round the corner and we're done, this is wonderful. This moment here, that first of all, Elizabeth Montgomery's smile is always good. And there's that smile that we all know and fell in love with on Bewitched. And they're close. They're like, they're this dying. Is, this has been a love story about two lonely people who found each other in the Twilight Zone. Yeah. In the Twilight Zone. Perfect. And, and Twilight Zone wasn't like that. It would always leave you with, you know, what you wanted to do. Yep. So, and, and again, the credits to Elizabeth Montgomery, Charles Bronson, really a beautiful episode and a Twilight Zone episode and and, and a surprisingly hopeful ending. Yes. You know, it's this really downbeat episode of the Twilight Zone, but a, a really hopeful ending. And that's... Nobody dies. No, nobody nobody dies. No, they're all dead already. <laughs> no, exactly. And the invaders... That's not the case where yes. they're in an episode. Somebody dies there, okay? Um, and Dick York episode was very light, very upbeat. Yeah. This one starts out dark. You think it's going to end dark, and it doesn't. Nobody dies. I would like to think there's a happy ending somewhere in their future and, and that they will live. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for them, and I don't really need a sequel. Um. That's right. And you know what? And that's another thing about today's television movies. God forbid there's a happy ending. You know, I don't know how many shows that I've watched that have been terrific, you know, whether they're episodic or movies, and then everything is going great, and then they'll say, oh, you know what? Bob just died. And they'll end it with Bob dying. I will, they, I will, I will make it my mission to send you movies and TV shows that have happy endings. This would be my mission because there's some good stuff out there, Herbie. And don't forget, I got a seven-year-old, so I am always scouting out those movies with happy endings. Good. Okay. All right. No, I know they're out there. I'm just saying overall. I'm with hey, you. Herbie, I'm real. I'm trying to be real here. Herbie J. Pilato of Then Again with Herbie J. Pilato. I, I love having you on the show. I will find other episodes for you to come on. I know we have David White did an episode and we'll see if we can track down some other episodes, which maybe, uh, you know, if you have some favorites, just send, send them along and we'll, and we'll talk about them. Um, and that's it for us today. Herbie, any final thoughts before we go? Just that Twilight Zone was an amazing series ahead of its time. Rod Serling was a genius. Uh, it's really wonderful that these episodes that we've looked at about that featured these bewitched stars were, were precursors to uh, Elizabeth's career, Dick's, Dick York's career, and David and uh, Agnes Moorhead's career. And it was the episodes, all the, the shows are, uh, the Twilight Zone is filled with people like that. 
who before they were stars. Uh, it was just nice that we, we explored all three of them um, in these last few weeks. And I was honored to do it, which is honored. Which is honored. I, you know, I wish I could, I wish I could do that thing. I you want me to do it? I yeah, can, do can, it. You, can you twitch your nose? It's not your nose that she moved. It was her upper lip. You move your upper lip and the nose falls into place. Interesting. Did you can, you, can you make me disappear? Did she tell Okay, Herbie. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, can you come back now? Uh, evidently, uh, your your friendship with Elizabeth taught you something. I'm glad it's you magic. said it's, it's all magic. about magic. <laughs> thanks, Herbie. We'll see you next time. And we'll see you guys next time for our next deep, deep dive into the Twilight Zone. Oh, that's a good name. Deep dive into the zone. There you go. I like it. It says what it is. It works. Okay. Our next deep dive into the zone. You know, it comes when it's <laughs> supposed to come. Herbie, thank you. <laughs>